Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with mini lobster pot pie. That's right, it was the ancient Greek storyteller Aesop who said good things come in small packages. And while I don't think he had fun-sized pot pies in mind, that very old saying really does work for these. By the way, he also said appearances can be deceiving, which actually doesn't apply here. Right, these things really are as amazing as they appear in the video. So with that, let's go ahead and get started by showing you our main ingredients. And for this, we will need one small five ounce lobster tail, which aren't cheap, but the good news is we're gonna be able to get two portions out of one. We will also need some diced celery and carrots, as well as some diced Yukon gold potatoes, or the potato of your choice. And then we will also try to find some fresh tarragon, which is a very sweet, very aromatic herb that is absolutely perfect with seafood. And what we'll do first is take our lobster tail and a pair of scissors, and we will cut through the shell just like this, and then crack it open, and then pull out the meat. And by the way, you can do this without the scissors, but we're gonna wanna cut the shell up in small pieces anyway. So for me, cutting it down the center to start makes sense. And then once we've pulled that out, we'll just set that meat aside for a moment, while we, as I said, cut the shell up into nice small pieces with our scissors. All right, shooting for like one or two inch pieces. And you're gonna see why that's so important in a few moments. But for now, we'll simply set that aside and reserve it until needed. And we'll take a paper towel and wipe off our board in case there's any shell fragments. Okay, nobody, and I mean nobody, wants shell fragments. And then what we'll do is take our knife and cut the tail into like half inch pieces. And while we do that, we'll check we haven't missed any pieces of shell, which I definitely did right here. And also, just like when we clean shrimp, if this still has a digestive tract, also known as the vein, we'll go ahead and remove that as well. Although this one was clean, except for whatever that little brown spot was. And that's it, as soon as we have that tail meat cut up into half inch pieces, we will transfer that onto a plate and we will pop it in the fridge to keep it cold until we need it. At which point we'll head to the stove where we will add our scissored shells to a saucepan containing some melted butter that we have set over medium heat. And what we'll do is cook that stirring for about three or four minutes or until the shells turn a brick red and the pan starts smelling of delicious roasted lobster. And the only reason we cut this up is because small pieces are much easier to saute in butter than two large halves of a shell. Which reminds me, it's never too late to scissor. So if you want to snip those in even smaller pieces, go ahead. And then what we'll do once those shell pieces have been cooked in the butter is toss in a splash of sherry, or brandy, or cognac, or the fancy booze of your choice, followed by one cup, which is also an eight ounce bottle of clam juice. And if you don't have that, you can just use chicken broth or if times are really tough, just some water. And what we'll do is give that a stir and reduce our heat to medium low. And we're basically gonna steep those shells in this liquid for about 15 to 20 minutes to create what is basically a lobster flavored clam juice tea. And I said medium low, you might actually wanna adjust it closer to low. Since we really don't want this to reduce, we're just trying to extract those flavors out of the shell. And that's it, after about 15 or 20 minutes, we'll remove that from the heat and we will strain out the shells, leaving us with just under a cup of what's hopefully a very lobstery broth. And yes, this part is optional. You can make this recipe with just the clam juice and the sherry, but the extra flavor you get from this very easy optional step is profound. I mean, you paid for that lobster shell. Let's use that lobster shell. And then once that's set, we can rinse out our saucepan and melt a little more butter over medium heat. And we will toss in our carrots and celery as well as a little touch of paprika and about a teaspoon or so of tomato paste, which I really do think you should buy in the tubes, since who wants to open up a whole can of tomato paste to get one teaspoon? Nobody, that's who. And then we will also season this up with some kosher salt, some freshly ground black pepper, and a few shakes of cayenne just to stay in shape. And then what we'll do is cook this stirring on medium for about two minutes, just to sort of toast that tomato paste and wake up that paprika. And once we feel like that's happened, we can go ahead and add some flour, right? Not too much, just like a tablespoon. And we'll stir that in and we'll cook that for about a minute or two to form what we call in the business a roux, R-O-U-X. And then once we've taken the raw edge off that flour, we'll go ahead and transfer in our reserved lobster broth and we'll give everything a stir. And as this comes up to temperature and starts to simmer, you should notice the mixture will start to thicken slightly. And in case you're one of these people that's afraid of lumps, please relax. There is zero chance you're gonna end up with lumps here. 
And then what we'll do at this point, after draining them, is toss in our diced Yukon Gold Potatoes. And we will stir those in. And then all we have to do is adjust our heat to medium-low, or whatever setting gives us a very gentle simmer. And we will simply let that cook until our potatoes and vegetables are tender, which because we've diced them nice and small, is only going to take about 10 or 15 minutes. Okay, it depends on the exact size. And while we're waiting, we can go ahead and prep our puff pastry. And by prep, I mean punch out circles with a pastry cutter that's roughly the same size as our ramekins. And as you know, we always want to cut puff pastry while it's still partially frozen, or at least very, very cold. And of course, you're going to save those trimmings, since there's literally hundreds of delicious things you could make with that. But anyway, once we have our circles cut, we'll go ahead and cut an X right in the center, possibly for venting purposes, but also mostly for appearance sake. And then the last thing we'll do would be to brush these lightly with an egg wash. And this is also an optional step, but it really does make it brown up much nicer. And I think it's way more visually appealing. But anyway, you decide. I mean, you are after all the Socrates of how you should make these. And once those are set, we'll go ahead and transfer those into the fridge and keep them cold until we need them. And that's it, we'll head back to the stove to check our veggies. And if everything's gone according to plan, they should be just about tender, as tested with a spoon or the tip of a knife. And please note, while that cooked, our liquids did reduce a little bit, which is exactly what we want. And then speaking of liquid, once our veggies are done, we'll go ahead and add a little squeeze of lemon juice, as well as a splash of heavy cream. And then we will also toss in our chopped tarragon, which like I said, I think is a key ingredient. And we will stir all that together, and we will turn our heat up to medium. And we'll wait for that to return to a simmer. And by the way, we always want to scrape off that dark stuff that caramelizes on the edge of the pan, which I like to call side fond, F-O-N-D. And even though there's not a ton of it, that is definitely going to add a tremendous amount of extra flavor to our mixture. So we'll do that. At which point I like to cook this for about five minutes, just to reduce and thicken things up a little bit more. And of course, we can also taste for salt at this point. And since we use clam juice, we should be fine. But we never like to guess, so give it a taste. And that's it. Once our mixture tastes good and looks good, we'll go ahead and stir in our lobster meat. And we will also turn off the heat. And as soon as that's been mixed in, we will pull that off the stove. And we will divide that mixture evenly between two six-ounce ramekins. And a couple tips here. Make sure you try to divide that lobster meat evenly between the two portions. And also, if you can, try to get it all in the ramekin and not on the pan. Which reminds me, we definitely want some foil underneath these because there will definitely be some bubble over, or hopefully not too much, but there will be a little. And please make sure you transfer all the chunks from the pan into these ramekins. And once all that's in there, then we can spoon over as much sauce as will fit, stopping about a quarter inch from the top. And if you end up with about a tablespoon of sauce left in the saucepan, which is a possibility, just go ahead and eat it. That is a chef's snack, which you've definitely earned. And then once those have been filled, we'll go ahead and top them with our puff pastry. But before I do, I like to push my finger through that X we cut, just to sort of open that up a little bit. And if it's a little bigger or a little smaller than the ramekin, that's no big deal. All right, puff pastry has a mind of its own, and it never cooks up perfectly uniformly in something like this, but that's fine. The randomness is all part of the show. And yes, we do want the egg wash side up, which sounds obvious, but you would be surprised. And that's it. Once those have been topped with our puff pastry, they are now ready to transfer into the center, or the upper center, of a 425 degree oven for about 20 minutes or so, or until they're bubbling and that puff pastry is beautifully browned. And then we should probably let these rest for at least five minutes before we serve them, if only because they're going to be way too hot to taste and enjoy. So I do like to let these cool a little bit before carefully transferring those onto a plate. And of course, warning all our guests, those ramekins are super hot. And even though that looks spectacular as is, if we want to dress it up a little bit, we could garnish with a sprig of tarragon, which looks nice and smells great, and is a nice touch if you have to take some contractually obligated pictures. But anyway, let's get down to business, and we'll lose that sprig and grab a spoon. And no, I don't know why I removed it. No idea. And then before we really dig in here, I'm going to take a couple spoonfuls of the sauce, and I'm going to do that for a couple reasons. First of all, it tastes unbelievably delicious, but also this ramekin is really full, and I do not want to lose even one drop of that sauce running down the side of the ramekin. So I'm going to start off very slowly. 
But anyway, after eating a few spoons of the underneath, I went ahead and got way more aggressive and dug right in. Oh, and I should definitely mention that a true, authentic, real pot pie is made with pie crust dough and not puff pastry, which is definitely a little easier to eat. But the reason I do prefer the puff pastry, besides that I think it looks a little better when it comes out of the oven, is because it's so buttery that it doesn't dissolve into the sauce. Okay, it will get soft and it will get saturated, but it stays as identifiable pieces of pastry. And at this point, we need to talk about size. All right, this is a small portion, but I think it's the perfect portion. All right, this is beyond delicious, but it's also very rich and decadent. So to me, this makes the perfect special occasion starter or appetizer. And maybe when you finish, you want one more bite, which is way, way better than finishing something and feeling like you had too many bites. And it sort of loses its magic. Okay, is that what they mean when they say the point of diminishing returns? I'm never quite sure how to use that expression. But anyway, like I said, I think this is perfect for a first course. Or pair it with a nice big Caesar salad, and you would have one fantastic special occasion meal. But anyway, that's it. What I'm calling mini lobster pot pies. Yes, these do require a little bit of prep and a couple different steps, but the procedure is very easy. And the result's nothing short of spectacular, which is why I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy.